Hi guys, it's Carl at Purple Moose Plays. Today I'm going to show you a game that requires nothing but a pen, two dice, and a piece of paper. That's right, I'm stepping into the world of Roll and Write, taking a look at Deepwater Games' upcoming new Roll and Write floor plan. Let's head to the table, see how it plays, and then I'll come back up here and tell you what I thought. Before I begin, it's worth noting that the components in this video come from a print and play demo on the Deepwater Games website, and as such are not representative of the final product. To begin a game of floor plan, each player receives a player map, and begins by drawing the starting room on their floor plan. In this case, the demo version uses a 3x3 square, with the bottom right corner over the circle on the player map. In addition, Two clients are selected, which will represent bonus scoring at the end of the game. In the demo version of this game, we will be using the courtyard, which represents one tree and a complete pool that is surrounded on all sides by rooms. Complete pool means the pool is also surrounded on all sides by stones. The other client we will be using for the demo version is the master bedroom, which is a 4x4 or larger bedroom that is connected via doors to two closets and a washroom. A game of floor plan is played out over a series of rounds, during which players will use dice rolls to add features and rooms to their floor plan, scoring points, and hopefully meeting the wishes of the clients that were selected at the beginning of the game. To begin each round, two dice are rolled. Each player will be using these two dice in one of two ways to add to their floor plan. The dice can either be used together to add a room to the floor plan, or separately to add two different sets of features to the floor plan. To add a room to the floor plan, dice are used to determine first the size of the room. In this case I've rolled a 3 and a 1, meaning I could build a 3x1 or 1x3 sized room. The type of room is also determined by the number on the dice. In this case, having rolled a 1 or a 3, I would be able to draw a hallway, represented by the 1, or a washroom, represented by the 3. In this case, that means I could draw a 3x1 or 1x3 hallway or washroom of my choice. Every room being added to the playmat must be added so that it is connected to a room that is already existing on the player mat. In this case, I might choose to draw a 1x3 hallway off of the room in this direction. In addition to drawing the room, the room must be labeled by type. A hallway in this case is represented by an H, and I must choose one of the empty spaces inside of that room and mark it as such. In this case, I might mark in the middle H. Having added a room to my board, I need to check off the appropriate room at the bottom of the board. To demonstrate one more time, in this case rolling a 6x6, six six, I have no choice but to draw a room that is of size 6x6. Six six. But, 6 is a wild card, meaning I can label this room as any type of room that I choose. In this case, I could draw a 6x6 six six room in this place. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We would draw a square 6x6 six six in that spot. Seeing as this is a large room, I might label this as something like a living room, which generally would be associated with a 5, but again, as I rolled a 6, which is a wild card, I'm allowed to label that as anything I would like. Labeling the living room allows me to check off this box down here. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's a yellow compass picture that I have just crossed off, unlocking me a compass bonus on the side. I will come back to explain the bonuses later as we move on. In addition to using the dice to draw a room, we also have a second choice. The second choice is to add a feature to the already existing rooms on your player map. In this case, at the beginning of a round, if a 4 and a 5 had been rolled, instead of drawing a room, I could instead look down here at the features list and use these two dice separately to draw two different sets of features. The feature types are listed below, but also the number of features is represented by the number of the die as well. In this case, a 4 represents 4 square feet of pool, and the 5 represents 5 one by one squares of furniture. In this case, when we plan a pool, the pool should always be surrounded by stones at the end of the game to build it, 
So we want to make sure that there is space around the outside of the pool. For example, I could draw four squares of pool like this. Furniture I need to keep in mind that I am aiming for different shapes of furniture throughout the game. So I could make something like this, representing four pieces of one by one furniture. And as I have to draw five, I could then also draw one over here. Adding furniture later in the game allows me to add further pieces to one piece of furniture that's already been drawn or to start a new piece of furniture elsewhere in the house. Other things that we could be drawing on the board are trees, which need to be placed outside and fill a three by three square. As such, doors, which are one of the most important features of the game because a room without a door to the outside will not score any points at the end of the game. And therefore, we need to have doors connecting both from room to room and then finally outside of the house. When a room door is drawn, it must be drawn on the inside of a room. And it does take up a one by one square of the room it's placed in. Windows, when we draw windows, we draw three windows at a time. And windows should be drawn in such a way that they face trees for scoring at the end of the game. In addition, windows may be drawn either on the inside of a wall like this or on the outside of a wall like this. Finally, if we draw a six, a six lets us draw stones. Six stones, again, stones should be drawn so that they go around a pool because surrounded pools at the end of the game will score points. As I mentioned before, as you continue to add rooms to your floor plan, you will continue to cross out squares at the bottom of the mat, unlocking these bonuses in the bottom left of the board. There are three different types of bonuses, the compass, the cache, and this construction mark. Compass bonuses can be used to add plus one number or minus one number to your dice, making it a little bit more flexible as to what you're allowed to draw on your turn. Cache allows you to use the result of one die twice when drawing features. And the construction allows you to use the combo of dice twice to add two rooms of the same size to your board in one turn. These bonuses can be used in combination and you can use as many as you have at any point when you're drawing a picture on your floor plan. Players continue rolling dice, adding rooms and features using bonuses to finish drawing their floor plan until one player finishes two tasks. Tasks happen in such a way. When any feature is completely full, you score two points into your task area. Also, should any client have their wishes fulfilled, this points total in the corner is added to your task area. When one player has completed two tasks, the game immediately ends at the end of that round. So let's move on to see how scoring works. So what you see here is what a floor plan or player mat may look like at the end of one of your games. Before I go into scoring, however, there's one thing that I forgot to mention that I would like to point out. When you build your third hallway, on the third hallway square, you'll see a small S that's labeled there. That small S is not shown in the bonuses at the bottom. That small S will actually allow you to label your starting room as any of the seven types of rooms. It is worth noting, however, that once you've filled all of the blocks of a specific room, you can no longer add that room to your mat. Looking at endgame scoring is actually a fairly easy task. Simply follow what it says at the bottom of the page. To begin, we start by scoring rooms. To score a room, you simply add up the leftmost number in front of each room type. So in this case, 6 plus 6 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 scored me 24 points for rooms. The next thing we score is furnishing. Furnishings score by the number of different shapes of furniture we have in the house. In this case, I've managed to build one, two, three, four, five, six different shaped furniture pieces. Six different pieces means it scores me eight points. Trees are simply scored for the number of trees that you have. I have four trees on this map, 
meaning I scored 8 points. Pools are only scored if they're surrounded on all sides by stones, in which case you score each square of pool being 1 point. So I have a 4 square pool, so I've scored 4 points. Next, we score windows. Windows we will score 1 point for every window that looks directly out onto a tree. In this case, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4 windows that are facing this tree here, so I have scored 4 points. And finally, if any of your rooms don't make it out through a clear path, through the rooms and outside, here I have two doors outside, any room that does not connect to those outside doors scores me a minus one point. In this case, you can see here, unfortunately, at the end of the game, I placed a hallway piece that I was unable to connect, and therefore I scored minus one. Adding up the two points from the tasks will give you this points here, plus the total of all of your rooms and features added together scores you the total points for the game. The person with the most points is, of course, the winner. In the event of a tie, the player with the highest scoring task score will be the winner. Should there still be a tie, the person with the fewest penalties for lack of doors wins. And in the case of there's still a tie, it's decided that you've both been great builders and the clients are equally pleased with both of you, and you will share your victory. Alright, having seen that, now you should have a little bit of an idea how to play the game. Let me talk a little bit about what I thought about the game. I guess I should begin, I'm going to ruin things a little bit here, by telling you I like this game a lot. There's got to be a reason I made a video. As you've seen, this is my first video on the channel. I've been looking to do it for a while, and I thought, hey, this looks fun, why not? I was actually perusing Instagram, and I saw Jamie Stegmeier post a picture of this game, and I thought, wow, I need to try that. And when I saw there was a print-and-play demo available, I went and got that print-and-play demo, I tried it, I enjoyed it, I'm here showing you this video. Let me talk a little bit about what I enjoy. First thing, player count. I'm a solo gamer a lot of the time because I don't often have people to play with. As a teacher, I'm home, sometimes on schedules that other people aren't home on, so I gotta find a way to play some games, and I can play this solo. Uh, right now, it's just a solo score, highest score kind of solo game, but I don't mind that because the game is fun, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Sticking with the player count, though, I want to talk that this game goes up to crazy numbers of players if you have the space, if you have the availability, if you have the paper. Just like their previous game, Welcome 2, all you need is a pen, two dice, because two dice is used by everybody in the room, and however many player mats you need for as many players as you have. That means if I have 50 people in a room that fit in the room, yeah, that's a big room, but if I have 50 people that fit into a room, I give them 50 player mats, I roll the dice, I probably need a camera to put those dice up on a screen somewhere, but everybody plays the same game with the same dice. The cool thing here, though, is that there is a timer, and that timer is run by the fastest player in the room. So even with 50 people, even with however many people you're playing this game, there's interaction. You're not directly influencing their player mats, but you are influencing the speed of the game, and whoever finishes first triggers the end of that game, so you need to compete with the other play players that you're playing with. Another thing I like about this game is the ease of play. As you've seen, the instructions and the setup and the explanation for how to play this game isn't very long, and yeah, I mean, it speaks for itself. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot, it's pretty easy to play. All you gotta do is roll some dice, Use those dice to draw something, aiming for a couple of different unique scoring situations, and it takes probably 30-40 minutes to play. There is a little bit of a downside that it might get longer if people take time drawing out the perfect you know, floor plan, but it's fun. You won't, you won't really notice if it goes a little bit longer than you'd expect a game like this to go. Theme. Theme is the, th theme is the key here. This game is oozing theme. How many times have you sat down and thought, hmm, I wonder what my dream home would look like, and start drawing pictures and plotting out what you think, you know, a house would look like that had everything in it that you want. This is the game that lets you do that as a game. You know, you're, you're drawing a floor plan, and every time you play this game, you're going to have different things you're doing, different aims, different goals. You're trying to draw a cool house, and that theme really, really helps this game. This isn't just roll dice and circle numbers. This isn't just roll dice and cross out blocks. This is roll dice and make a floor plan, and it's fun. The theme is great. I will say, however, that the theme does hinder the game a little bit, meaning that when you're drawing the game, sorry, when you're drawing the player mat, 
you might start aiming towards the theme rather than aiming towards scoring points. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? Do I want to draw a house that looks cool or do I want to draw a house that scores points? If I'm playing the game to play the game, I want to score points. If I'm playing a game to have fun, maybe a mixture of both. And I think that's where I find myself most of the time. The other thing that's yet to be seen is the variety that's coming with this game. As I mentioned in the rules, every game you're using two of these clients that do the bonus scoring. I have yet to see how many other clients they're going to be putting out. Hopefully there's a nice variety, in which case the game has a nice variety. It'll have some replay value. The other thing I'm not sure about is the starting room. In the beginning, I showed you in the demo version, you use a three by three square for the demo, or, sorry, the demo vision starting room. But is that going to change? Will there be a list of different starting rooms? That's yet to be seen. Again, this is a preview for an upcoming game, but consider me impressed. Consider me intrigued, and I will be following this one. Check it out. If you haven't, go to Deepwater Games' website, find the print and play, print it out and try it yourself. I guarantee you'll have a good time. That's me, Purple Moose Plays. Talk to you next time. See ya.